Thank you, Chris. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. I would like to start by uh, thanking the several organizations that are responsible for putting together this wonderful event. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the University of Johannesburg, where we are right now. Secondly, and this is not in descending order, I should add, um, Global Governance Africa and their remarkable work in general and specific the Lusophone Center initiative, which I think is really important, especially for a country such as South Africa, surrounded by two large Lusophone countries, Mozambique and Angola. Uh, I think it's very important to have a deep knowledge of these societies because their trajectory, not just in the context of SADC, but even in bilateral terms, is very important for South Africa. So any effort that increases public knowledge about what is going on in uh, Luanda or in Maputo or in, in these societies is uh, very, very uh, laudable. I would also like to thank uh, my fellow panelists. It's a particular pleasure to have Raphael, Elias, and Justin here. Um, Justin, I know very well from Oxford days, and um, as uh, Chris hinted at and Alan confirmed, this is very much an Oxbridge panel, a male Oxbridge panel, I should add. Um, but uh, Justin uh, and, 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 and my acquaintance go ba goes back to the war years when Justin was the correspondent for the BBC and the Mail and Guardian in Luanda in another incarnation, which has had a remarkable role in informing his academic work. And I very much uh, encourage you to read his uh, outstanding new uh, uh, monograph on the Angolan War, which is, um, in short, the best book produced to my mind on the Angolan Civil War um, thus far. Um, the same applies to Elias' uh, extraordinary work with Open Society, which is really one of the few, if not the only major foreign organization that still has a foothold in Angola. All others, there are about 100 uh, foreign NGOs in Angola uh, in 2002, the starting year for the book that I'm going to talk to you about. Now there's only a handful left. Because of a series of um, strategies the government has pursued that we tend to associate with Vladimir Putin, the space not just for foreign NGOs but for any local NGOs that are substantially funded from abroad has shrank to insignificance. So Elias's work is uh, all the more significant for that. And finally, Raphael needs no introduction. Raphael is not just a morally brave person, but a physically courageous individual who's uh, for many years been one of the few voices in Angola who stood uh, by to say sometimes very obvious things that no one else was saying uh, at uh, some great personal cost, uh, both in terms of his earlier work for Open Society and later with Mac Angola. We owe to Raphael some of the greatest insights into, um, and I, this is the academic speaking, the functioning of the regime regime, its inner workings, its political economy. So I'm, again, I'm very glad to have you all here um, uh, to discuss um, contemporary Angola, the trajectory of Angola since 2002. Um, and for those of you in South Africa, Angola conveys the images from the war from the 1970s, from the 1980s. The South African episode of the Angolan War, however tragic it may have been, was only uh, 14, 15 years of a much, much longer conflict. In fact, the Angolan Civil War lasted 41 years and it killed about a million Angolans. It really started in 1961 in the guise of an anti-colonial war. It continued as a proxy Cold War from 1975 onwards. And it really then became a proper civil war from 1992 until 2000. 2002. By the time the conflict ended with the death of John Savimbi, the leader of UNITA, the country was in tatters. There was practically nothing left outside Luanda. Large cities like Wambo and Kuito had been essentially demolished by bombardments, by heavy artillery, um, and the country was um, exhausted. Um, the book that I've written tells us what's uh, really happened ever since. And what's happened ever since is something absolutely extraordinary. The Angolan economy between 2002 and 2012 increased tenfold in size. The greatest economic growth, according to Ernst & Young, in the world in that specific decade. It went from an economy of $12 billion of GDP to an economy of somewhere around $130 billion of GDP, becoming Africa's third largest economy after Nigeria and South Africa. Just to give you an example, the Kenyan economy is a robust interesting economy in East Africa. The Angolan economy is three times larger than the Kenyan economy. It's essentially the size of the whole of the East African economy with Ethiopia, Uganda, and Tanzania put together with Kenya. Just to give you some numbers here. 
what happened during this period was that Angola, which was already a, a, a very resource-rich country, a major diamond producer, but most importantly, the second largest oil producer in Africa, Angola experienced very quickly from 2002 to 2007, 2008, two interlinked phenomena. The world price for oil went from 22 barrels, $22 a barrel to $147 a barrel between 2002 and 2008. The oil production in Angola went from um, 1 million barrels a day to 2 million barrels a day in 2008, only in only five years. So what this generated was a remarkable, unprecedented amount of resources, the likes of which no African country, not even Nigeria in the 1970s, uh, was able to experience. Um, this generated about $467 billion in revenues. That is half a trillion dollars that um, essentially flowed into the Angolan economy during this short decade. So with these resources, available, the regime was able to not only uh, win the war, but to find the nature of the peace. So the book is about the, the, the victors of the war, the Angola they imagined, and the Angola they brought into being in the subsequent decade. So this is the first factor that really explains an Angolan trajectory that is very eccentric. It is not your straightforward post-conflict trajectory that the UN comes in, the Western donors come in, start dictating conditions about the opening of markets, the democratization, women's rights, microcredit, whatever you want to call it. This was an Angolan-defined uh, route to reconstruction. The first factor that allowed this, I've just mentioned it, was the resource endowment. The second factor, was the fact that this was a war victory. This was not a woolly compromise, a power sharing agreement, a UN brokered this or that, like so many African conflicts in the post-Cold War period have ended up uh, being. And I don't, I say I have not ended up ending because oftentimes these imperfect ends of war lead to uh, a restart of war a few years later. In the case of Angola, this was a classic demolition of the rebel war machine by the government with, at the time, still perhaps today, the largest army in sub-Saharan Africa with 120,000 men, MiGs, heavy artillery, a, a very, very, very uh, um, um, ruthless war machine that the government uh, uh, was able to build. And that gave it complete ownership of the peace. It really gave it uh, a, 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 the sort of peace that, for instance, for Limo was never able to afford in Mozambique because it had to come to terms with Runamo in one way or the other. So that's the second factor, the unambiguous nature of the end of war. The third factor was the coming of China. The coming of China from circa 2004 onwards has to be seen um, in the context of the oil revenues, in the context of the hegemony of the regime in Angola. And so it's not the single explanatory factor, but piled on to the other factors that I've mentioned, it is very important. Essentially, China was looking for a cheap and reliable source of oil provision, and it made available to Angola uh, what was by 2009, in only five years, about $19 billion in credit lines that allowed the Angolans access not just to money but to expertise in national reconstruction with none of the conditions um, that the Western donors would uh, normally put on the table. So this allowed the Angolans to do one thing that is very important, to define reconstruction, not only in the rather eccentric terms that I'm going to outline in a second, but in particular to put forward a vision of reconstruction that was essentially about cement, that was essentially about the rebuilding, not just of the physical infrastructure of Angola, which had been destroyed by the war, but of a certain vision of modernity, a certain idea of Angola as the sort of modern place which the elite yearned to have. And the incarnation of that was the idea of Luanda being rebuilt as Africa's Dubai. So Luanda in the last seven or eight years in particular has essentially been bulldozed and rebuilt with skyscrapers, with marinas, and with the sort of uh, urban uh, 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 structures and the, the uh, urban uh, precedents that you associate with this Persian Gulf sort of generic uh, modernity. So it's very important for us to understand that in 2002, you would get to Angola and you'd see uh, uh, essentially a, a war-torn country, essentially in tatters, 
by 2008, and for those of you who only made it to Angola a few years after the end of the war, you'd be confronted with something of a different order altogether. And it is this project, both as an ideological project and as something that materializes quite concretely at the ground level, that I wanted to come to terms with. And I did that uh, by uh, doing it in the only way that I know how to do things, but which I think is absolutely essential for this particular type of project, by hanging out. Uh, people can, in, in academic terms, they can say that it's participant observation, ethnography, but a lot of time in your hands, spending time at the ground level, listening to people, listening hard. Um, that's the way this book was written over many years, but in particular three crucial years during which uh, I was able to pay, spend a, a particular amount of time um, in Angola. Um, and throughout this period, I found uh, several things that I think is important. And I'm just going to outline four major themes. Um, it's not exhaustive. I'm not trying to give you a, a sort of a bluffer's guide to the book. I hope you buy it. Um, the first theme is that uh, you're really dealing with a hegemonic political order created by a former liberation movement which was in existence since the late 1950s, I'm referring here to the MPLA, which for many years was one of several competing political forces in Angolan politics. There were the Portuguese colonialists, there was UNITA, the other rebel movement, there was a third rebel movement, the FNLA. By 2002, the MPLA had managed to destroy all its rivals to deal away with all the external threats such as the South African invasion in the 70s and the 80s and had essentially taken control of this state. A state of which it was the legal government of since 1975, but which as late as 2002, two weeks before the end of the war, the MPLA did not control 60% of the Angolan territory. Now if you think that Angola is the size of Germany, France and Italy put together, then you see that vast swathes of this region were essentially ungoverned until the end of the war. So for the MPLA, this was an authoritarian project of state building in which Angola was finally going to be modeled in their own image. This is a very important point because Angola does run elections. There are some increasingly fewer rituals of pseudo-liberalism. Uh, I think in the last six months, the mask has fallen and you don't see any of that. You see police beat up the mothers of political prisoners demonstrating on the streets a few days ago. Uh, but for most of the period since 2002, what you, you have had is a certain preoccupation with playing a certain game of democracy, recognizing the existence of an official opposition. But the reality at the ground level is a draconian control by a party state in which the state and the party are virtually undistinguishable and topping all of this President Ushantos, who's been in power since 1979, who was the person who re-engineered the political economy of Angola after the end of the Cold War around what you could define as an oligarchic capitalism of sorts. And the people who won the war also won the peace, if you will. They saw uh, the uh, uh, peace as a huge business opportunity for themselves, the, the, the reconstruction of the country. And this takes me to the second level, or the second question, which is the question of the, the economy of, of, of Angola since 2002. It became obvious to President Ushantos that it wasn't enough to just continue with the profiteering schemes of the war years, that the political economy of the peace would have to be reconceptualized away from those structures of the 1990s. But the imperative was to keep the same people who control the economy of the war years in control of the, of the peace economy. So the small cast of characters that you see around the Angolan president, the generals, um, a few people in, Angle, in the president's family, they were massive beneficiaries of the extraordinary business opportunities made available by this tenfold increase in the size of the Angolan economy. So you've seen the rhetoric being a rhetoric about pro-poverty, uh, pro uh, alleviation, but in reality what you have is a pattern of social expenditure that essentially marginalized about 80% of Angolans. It made some focus on a would-be middle class in, in the cities, but was disproportionately concentrated on what you could describe Russian style as the Angolan oligarchs, as these people who became super rich cosmopolitan individuals who straddle the world, who are in a way no longer Angolan because they've built business empires that are globalized and hyper sophisticated, uh, but their roots are the, the Angolan state and the possibilities that the control of the Angolan state and the oil rents have allowed in the last 10 years. A third theme that I wanted to emphasize is the theme of 
um, of uh, the staffing of the economic miracle of Angola. And it, it really is impressive, as the book tries to explain. If you spend some weeks in Luanda, you do see in Luanda skyscrapers, uh, Rolls Royces, Ferraris, the best restaurants. Luanda's become the most expensive city in the world. Um, in the last seven or eight years. You see a material culture of luxury and of modernity that gives you the impression that Angola has gone very far. Um, but in reality, these, these, these benefits have, have not been shared by the vast majority. Uh, but they're non negligible in the sense that they've brought in a vast class, and this is the Dubai analogy, they've brought in a vast class of service providers. So if the cost of foreigners that you would find in the odd Angolan bar in the late 90s would be mercenaries, oilmen, and a few aid workers. The cost of the last 10 years is completely different and of a whole different size. I'll just give you some examples. Uh, last year, there were 200,000 Portuguese expats in Angola, at least 250,000 Chinese expats, probably about 80,000 Brazilians, and a absolutely unknowable number of illegal African immigrants, uh, mostly from the Congo, Senegal, um, Mali, et cetera, et cetera. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of service providers verging from street sweepers uh, from uh, Vietnam to the likes of KPMG, McKinsey, uh, Ernst & Young, who've become absolutely essential in the governance of Angola as subcontractors to the government. Um, and, and in between these extremes, a motley crew of international service providers that make the international reconstruction of Angola, as I've described in this brief presentation, really not an Angolan affair, but a global affair. But the important thing to bear in mind is that these foreigners are in Angola as service providers to advance the agendas of the elite. Um, the, Angola, the plan for Angolan reconstruction is obviously Angolan defined, and as uh, I mentioned earlier, not really to the benefit of the vast majority of the population. I could bore you with, or rather not bore you, maybe even interest you with many, many anecdotes because it's been a garish, extraordinarily brash and interesting decade in Angola. Um, a lot of it has panned out tragically as white elephant projects. Uh, some of you will know of the Israeli-built kibbutz uh, program for Angolan former workers that has probably cost about $700 million and is not working. Um, you've also heard about the cities built by the Chinese in the middle of the jungle, which have uh, uh, tens of thousands of, uh, in places like Lunda North, for instance, a, a city built in the middle of the jungle um, for 300,000 people with no one in it. A uh, whole industrial park outside Luanda that does, uh, essentially doesn't work. So the, the boom era left behind uh, littered, uh, the, the country's littered with, with, with uh, absolutely outrageous uh, visions of modernity that now that the uh, bust era has started are haunting um, Angolans and may do so in the coming decades. But let me just say two things before I finish. The first one is that uh, this decade has come to an end, but during this decade what you had was a virtual, a sense of, of impunity, a sense um, as uh, some policy intellectuals in the MPLA confided in me, the analogy for them was the PRI in Mexico, the Mexican ruling party that was in power for 70 years before it was kicked out uh, uh, from power. They're back, by the way, in Mexico. They had a sense of, not just a sense of entitlement, but the sense that they were the only force that had legitimacy to state build in Angola, that they were going to be in power, in other words, forever. Um, and that was matched by a sense of demobilization. Average Angolans were just happy to be alive. They were just happy not to be shot at. Um, so they were not deeply involved in, uh, certainly not in partisan poli politics, but not even in social contestation. Now, over the last three years, this uh, extraordinary honeymoon, if you will, this decade-long passivity on the side of the population has disappeared. And I'll end by just outlining three dynamics that I think are very important uh, for South Africans and for all those in the region to understand the Angolan future. The first one is the fact that after a decade of relentless rhetoric on economic diversification, with which none of us could possibly disagree, Angola needs to diversify away from oil. 96% of Angolan exports come from the oil sector. Angola is not a petrol state, it's a caricature of a petrol state. So the government has rightly emphasized diversification. In 2015, Angola is more dependent on oil revenues than it was in 2002. Okay, so you can imagine what the drop in oil prices over the last year has done to, to, to the status quo. Most importantly, 
um, they have not been able to generate large-scale large -scale employment. And the problem with Angola, it's in many African countries, but I think in the case of Angola, it's even deeper, is the demographic problem. Between 70 to 75% of Angolans are below the age of 25. Anyone above the 35, people like me, I'm 38, the reference point is always the war years. So even if they don't agree with the status quo, the comparison is always positive. For young people, the Angolan Civil War means the same thing as the Second World War means to me. And their reference point is not the war, but the comparison between the lives that they're leading today with the material culture of success that they're bombarded with through television and which they cannot access. And this is very important. 15 years ago, Angola had bleak Soviet-style media. Now it has some of the sleekest media contact anywhere on the continent, produced mostly by Brazilian media uh, specialists that relentlessly bring into the households of poor Angolans uh, the, the dream life of the rich. So you can imagine how this is materializing, especially amongst young males, especially in the shanty towns, and especially coalescing around Angolan hip hop, the so-called Kuduro movement, which is very similar to American hip hop in the 1990s. It's misogynist, it's about brands, and it's uh, not depoliticized, but it, not politicized, but it incarnates a certain frustration with the status quo. The third and most important factor that I think is very worrying is President Dushantos. He's been in power for 36 years now. He's very smart. And a few successes of the last 40 years can conceivably be ascribed to him. Um, but this has come to at the cost of a deep deinstitutionalization of Angolan um, political processes. It's not just that the public administration doesn't matter, the ministers, the National Assembly, all of this is a facade. The party itself has been deinstitutionalized, and decision-making lies with him and him alone, and a few people around him. This means that his demise is likely to be as traumatic um, as you would expect. He has not built a fair society. He has not built the structures to guarantee his own succession. I'm told that now he wants to stay in power until 2022. That's the new sort of informal deadline for his exit. Um, so Angola, in many ways, and without underplaying the extent to which Angola is a society at peace in some ways, it is a society that it will not go back to large-scale warfare like it had between uh, before 2002. But I cannot help looking back at the last 13 years as an extraordinary miss op missed opportunity. With a country like Angola being an upper middle income country, but having some of the highest child mortality rates in the world. However, in the last year, in tandem with the, um, the craze in oil prices, we have seen also an extraordinary mobilization of Angolan society, and particularly young, uh, very, very idealistic campaigners. We've seen uh, a general frustration in Angolan society. So I don't think that the dynamics I've been outlining to you in this presentation are going to remain still. still. I think that Angola is kicking noisily back into life and um, watch that space. Wow. The University of Johannesburg. Rethink. Reinvent.